wasting money on cures Forgot how to fix myself They say that time is free Then why is it so precious? Oh, I'll say Okay, hi there, welcome everybody. Good morning to everybody joining in live on our Vision live stream. The first of a series of live streams as we head into April and into May, obviously with papers on the near horizon. It's great to see everybody. Uh, today our focus is gonna be market failure and a little bit of stuff on government intervention. I'm Jeff, uh, our production team are upstairs in the studio and they're, they're gonna pick out some of the great answers uh, as they come in the chat windows. So uh, hopefully one of your contributions will feature on the on the screen. This session is recorded, so if you're watching in the record, just press the pause button whenever you want to uh, to take a moment to think through the answers and also the questions. Uh, you need to be subscribed to the channel to be able to post in the chat window. So let's make a start. Welcome everybody. Just as people are joining us, uh, I thought I'd post a 60 second explanation question. Can you type in your best definition of market failure? Have a go. Lovely thanks to Cheer and Fergus and Millie. Uh, some lovely answers coming through there. And many people focus on misallocation of resources 
Fergus's answer was, uh, was absolutely spot on. Here's my suggestion. That's when the allocation of scarce resources, land, labour and capital, by the market mechanism is not efficient or socially optimal, leading to a loss of social welfare. So the really key point there is that the outcome we get is not optimal from a social welfare perspective. Now, to some economists, but not all, certainly to me, an inequitable allocation of resources is also a cause of market failure. Labour market failure, for example, leading to deep-rooted and persistent income inequalities. So it's good to have as part of your revision a kind of go-to definition of market failure, which you can uh, start and answer with. Well done. Let's just try one more 60-second application uh, explanation. Uh, by the way, superb start. Thank you for the answers. Explain why negative externalities for production can lead to market failure. Do have a go. Superb answers, as always. It's been quite a few answers there talking about uh, excessive consumption of demerit goods. Just have to be a little bit more tight and more focused. We're talking about here negative externalities in production rather than consumption. Although with Excel, it's the same diagram. Uh, with, uh, with AQA, for sure, it's definitely not the same diagram. So let's just quickly work through this together. So uh, the key thing, as quite a few of you got in the answers, uh, the market mechanism does not price or does not take into account the full social cost of production. Now, how do we measure social cost? Well, it's the marginal private cost plus the marginal external cost. So if the market doesn't price the externality properly, we, uh, we end up with overproduction and a deadweight loss of economic welfare. So it's important to, dis uh, to distinguish between consumption and production externalities, particularly with AQA, where you have four different externalities there. So moving on, uh, let's have a couple of, uh, I think I've got three multiple choice questions here. Uh, I, I'm slightly, uh, here we go. So the generation of electricity causes external costs. Who bears these external costs? So if you want to post your answer into the chat window. So the generation of electricity causes external costs. But who bears these external costs? This was a past question from 2022. I won't tell you the exam board. What do we think here? Lots of answers coming through, lots of people, in fact, the majority of people, Ellie and Alexandru and Libby and George all saying D, let's just double check. Indeed, so the community effects, they sometimes called the community welfare effects of, uh, of pollution. Good stuff. Now, let's have a look at the next question. Flights in the airline industry cause damage to the environment. Which of these measures, shown A, B, C or D, is most likely to result in a socially optimal number of flights. So what do we think here? Again, this was a 20 March 23 question. Flights in the airline industry cause damage, environmental cause damage. Which measure is most likely to result in a socially optimal number of flights? What do we think here? George and Sheila and Libby and Iad saying C. Most people here saying C, I think. Uh, we'll come on to put, we'll come on to option A in a second. Yep, answers coming through. Thank you for contributing, by the way. It's hugely useful to get these answers coming through. Let's double check. Yeah, C is probably the most likely result. A complete ban, of course, is not the appropriate thing because you've got to factor in the externalities, but it's not um, a, a ban doesn't doesn't address the market failure. The socially optimal number of flights is not zero. And the subsidy, well, well, that would be more to do with positive externalities. A couple of people uh, thought it could be D, but that would be more positive externalities. Next question is harder. Number three, coming up. 
The diagram shows the costs and benefits of producing a good. The good has negative externalities in production and positive externalities in consumption. Now the free market equilibrium is point X. So what is the new equilibrium point when the externalities are taken into account? So this is a diagram question. Take a moment on this. We have nearly 200 people in the live uh, discussion today, which is fantastic. Please do spread the word as we head into, into Easter. So if X is the free market equilibrium, what is the socially optimum combination? There are differences of opinion here. A couple of people saying A. Uh, a lot of people, Tom and Joel, saying B. To give you a clue here, it's either A, B, C or D. Hopefully that's useful. Isaac says B if you ask me. Well, Isaac, I just have, I have asked you. And you think it's B. Let's double check. It is B. And negative externalities in production mean that, means that you need move to marginal social costs. One positive externalities in consumption means you move to MSB one. And therefore the intersection is at point B. Superb stuff. Let's crack on. Thank you for the contributions. What we do, what we do in these revision sessions, we get students to write in their answers and collectively we get this amazing energy of, and focus from the Tutor to Student Collective. Can you give me please two examples of negative consumption externalities? Have a go. Yeah, lovely answer there from uh, initially from there from Sheila and uh, the beauty of that, that answer, it, it, it had a little bit of development in there, talking about the external costs for the NHS from obesity and uh, tobacco related illness. Uh, the more you can add that little bit of such as seasoning, as we talk about in Great Booster, then you're in great shape. So any third party effect, the wider costs for, for um, taxpayers. Uh, a lot of you talking about demoted goods there, negative consumption, which is all, all good. Political Gammon says downing a pint of pure motor oil. Well, that's a yeah, a really good answer. Uh, not one that one wouldn't ordinarily uh, think of. I actually used to be um, obsessed with drinking uh, brake fluid when I was younger, but it was okay. I was able to stop pretty easily. Here are my two answers, smoking and alcohol. I put the two together. Uh, crucial thing is what does it lead to? So obviously health problems, increased risk of accidents and violence. Try to link it to an externality. The one I've chosen um, as my second one is the overuse or the overconsumption of antibiotics. There's some evidence that GPs perhaps over prescribing antibiotics and then leading to excess consumption leads to antibiotic resistant bacteria, which in the long term makes it more costly to treat uh, these diseases. So it's up to you which ones you choose. Obviously, you take the context. Next slide. Hey, let's move on. Let's think of uh, this is harder. Can you give me two good examples, please, of positive production externalities? What are you going to go for? Have a go.
<clears throat> okay, some interesting answers that we picked out a few on the screen there. Uh, again, we need to be clear about the distinction between production and consumption externalities. So hopefully this will be useful uh, quick discussion here. So here are my two suggestions. Um, Rosalind has a really good, uh, really good point. We can pick that one out actually about the redevelopment of brownfield sites, giving back to the community, attracting businesses. That is a terrific example. Uh, it's almost like a community externality. So it's where the supplier, the housing developer, um, perhaps improves the local road system or perhaps creates a new park as part of a development. That would be a production externality. And it's a really good example, Rosalind. So thank you for that. Um, here are my two pollution controls. So when factories, for example, spend I don't know, 10 million pounds to install pollution controls in their factories, so particularly when it comes to air pollution, um, not only do you improve the environment in the immediate vicinity, but there's a wider, a wider benefit. So factories that up, upgrade to uh, more energy efficient technology less water usage, for example, in areas of water scarcity. Uh, the, the focus here is on when the supplier, the business, the firm creates, spends some money and creates a positive wider community benefit. And the other really important one, come back to Deep's point, is education, consumption and production. Well, I regard it as, as a consumption externality, essentially. Uh, spillovers from R&D, so when companies invest in research and development, maybe they develop a, a, a new technology, and oftentimes, if, they, if there are spillover benefits to other firms, it's often linked, for example, to, to uh, research compacts with universities, that can reduce costs for other firms. So the key thing here is really to think about the cost, and we'll look at a diagram in a second, the costs that are reduced for others as a result of a, of a cost incurred by the first party. My own uh, instinct is that education is consumed. I know I'm, I'm a provider. But by and large, it's a consumption externality. Okay, so now this is a tough question. This is really for OCR AQA, but I just thought I'd ask it anyway, because when you have a positive production externality, uh, marginal social cost lies below marginal private costs. Edexcel fans, look away now, we don't need this diagram. But AQA, which area shows the net social welfare loss when there are positive production externalities? And to give you a clue here, the, the private optimum is point A, but with positive externalities, Joshua and Pete uh, and Jasmine and Sam have all got the answer here. Let's double check. It is indeed A, C, E, Ace. Reminder, please, in the exam, don't label, uh, don't shade diagrams, label them, because examiners expect fully labeled diagrams. They don't look for shaded areas. Fantastic, let's move on. Let's think about mixed externalities. Now, hopefully you've covered this in the revision. If not, we'll, we'll cover it now. So 60 seconds, please. What are, if you can give an example even better, what are mixed externalities? Have a go. Again, thank you there to Charlotte and Fergus for some answers. You know, people saying this is not on the spec, it is on the spec for all exam boards. And critically, um, part of your evaluation is to argue that oftentimes there are mixed externalities. So you might get a question on negative externalities. The evaluation said, well, there could be some compensating positive externalities as well. Rosalind has a good example there. Uh, goods that can be both positive and negative. Plastic is good for human consumption, but bad for the environment. So plastic can reduce food waste, keeping food fresher for longer which is a good thing, but obviously we know about the long-term consequences of plastic pollution. Ted says, when positive and negative externalities are present. Um, yeah, really good examples there. Uh, my two examples, 
uh, are on the screen there. So mixed externalities, basically when any economic activity, economic activity generates both positive and negative externalities. Uh, pesticides in farming can raise farm yields, perhaps in countries where food security and uh, malnutrition is a hugely important issue, but obviously creates external costs as well. And plastic packaging, don't assume automatically that plastic packaging is bad, that there are negative, there are mixed externalities. The use of cars, for example, is a good example, the use of mass transport. So really good examples. Thank you for that. Let's look, move on. Let's just take one example. I'm just going to choose a couple of topical things that I think could be a focus this year. So this chart shows uh, wind energy generation in the UK, both onshore and offshore. Uh, and uh, critically, there has been a kind of slowdown in onshore wind generation. It's no higher in 2022-23 than it was in 2020. Um, we'll come on to the free rider actually in a second or two, uh, Tasha. Uh, whereas offshore wind gener generation continues to, to grow pretty qu pretty quickly. So here are two uh, opportunities for you to contribute. Oh, before we do that, this is electricity production in the UK. Actually, it's down on 2010. Of course, you'd hope energy efficiency has gone up, and it has. So uh, that is the production of electricity in the UK by source, and obviously the decline of coal is, is evident there. Let's move on to the next Contribution. Let's do some live revision. Can you probably give me two examples of external costs from an expansion of onshore wind turbines in the UK? So we're trying to choose topics here that we think could well be an exam focus. And I, I personally think wind turbines as part of renewables could be a great question. So can you pick out two external costs here? We'll pick out some answers on the screen. Daniel has a really good point about the opportunity cost of using the land for alternatives. Lovely use of, of doubling of concepts there. Thank you for these contributions, by the way. Joshua, great point there. It results in uh, reduced emissions, but also visual and noise pollution. Superb stuff. Well done. Uh, let's have a look at my two answers here. So I'm just, Again, nothing too dramatic here, but there's a visual impact. So the impact on the property values of nearby residential areas, noise pollution. And the other one I think is definitely worth noting if you're taking revision notes in this session, is decommissioning costs. So we're finding quite strong evidence that wind turbines commissioned what, 10, 20, 30 years ago, they may only have 25 year productive life. The decommissioning costs themselves can create external costs. So the components might not be renewable in that sense. So it's an increased landfill, what have you. And that is now becoming quite a substantial uh, issue, the decommissioning costs of wind turbines. Uh, okay, well, think about the counterpoint here. Can you give me two external benefits? Over to you. Yeah, loads of points coming through. Joshua talks about uh, job creation. Ted talks about diversifying the energy mix. 
and uh, George had a really good point about firms experimenting with new types of turbines. So over time, with dynamic efficiency, with advances in technology, the external cost in theory should come down and hopefully the external benefits um, go up. Lovely points from Sam about green sustainability, uh, but we're in a tight labour market, may not have the, uh, the skilled labour. And this is high level evaluation here. Really, really good stuff. Uh, excellent stuff. What are my two points coming through? Yeah, I think I picked out on reduced emissions. So obviously it's a contribution towards net zero and uh, then the impact of the long-term cost in the NHS. And I think energy diversification and security. The events of the last two or three years have told us, have they not, that Britain needs a much more robust, resilient and diversified energy mix, particularly when there are significant increases in energy prices, as we've seen. All good stuff. Excellent. Right. OK, moving on to mixed externalities. This is super important for evaluation. Let's spend a minute on this. If you really want to get an A or an A star on evaluation, it's often a great point to say that it's hard to measure and value externalities. Have a go at explaining why. Yeah, some lovely answers coming through about normative economics. Uh, Joshua here talking about uh, impacts not directly reflected in prices, subjective complexity in terms of, of quantifying uh, emissions effects, pollution effects. Interestingly, now with sensors and modern technologies, we can measure the degree and extent of pollution more accurately than we've ever could in the past. You know, we can measure uh, sewage emissions. We can measure uh, part, particulate pollution in, 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 in the air. So the technologies are allowing us to give a greater accuracy to measuring it. But as many of you were saying, uh, it's very hard to put a price on externalities. Um, so many externalities, human health impacts. Uh, if you want some really technical detail, it's not about life expectancy, it's about healthy life expectancy or risk of chronic illness. So many of these human health impacts, as well as uh, impact on uh, the natural environment. They don't have a well-defined market or price. And critically, the full consequences of externalities may not be immediately apparent. Air pollution, I'll give you a really good topical example in a second. Isaac says, don't forget about shadow pricing. We can, we can use shadow pricing. But again, there are often normative judgments involved in setting shadow pricing there. So this is really thinking about evaluation. Most students are really good on the technical analysis of externalities. The evaluation is how do we measure, how do we calibrate, how do we judge the extent of the market failure? So to give you a quick example, I think the next slide uh, gives a really good example. I just want to think about something that could be an exam topic. I think renewable energy could be wind turbines, uh, wood stoves, for example. So the government's now banning certain types of wood used in wood stoves. Um, evidence from the states about the impact of air pollution and the Guardian said in late last uh, last year that nearly uh, nearly one London in a day is dying early due to outdoor air pollution from solid fuel heating so we're starting to get a better understanding of the external costs of uh, a significant increase in use of wood uh, stoves and fireplaces adds value to the house but what about the external costs uh, not a prediction for any exam board. I'm just trying to choose topical issues that might well be the focus of an exam question. OK, let's move on. Almost there. Let's think about uh, one more aspect of public failure. Can you very quickly give me the two key characteristics of pure public goods? Have a go.
Excellent. I think you've all got it. These are the two essential ones. Here's, here's my answer just for brevity. So non-excludable, if you provide it for one, you provide it for all. Uh, essentially, the marginal cost of supply is zero once you've provided something. And crucially, non-rival or non-diminishable. So the consumption of the, of the public good by one person, in theory, does not reduce the amount available to somebody else. Although, obviously, with a quasi-public good, then one or more of those two characteristics are um, not applicable. Pete says, stop coming up with new names to say the same thing. Well, non-diminishable, is uh, it's, an, it's an interesting idea, a diminishing availability as the marginal cost of supply starts to become positive. I'll stick with those definitions. Let's have a quick look at an example here. Let's think about the idea of the free rider problem. Now, I want you to give me a really good definition, please, and a very good application. Let's see if you can give the best example of the free rider problem. Have a go. So the free rider is associated with public goods. We've got 200 people in live session here. How many people can give a great example of the free rider? What can we do? Yeah, I like the example of free riding on uh, TV licenses. Some people saying military service or the benefits of defence spending. Uh, my strong advice, by the way, in the exam is not to use street lighting. I know it's an obvious example of, of a pure public good, but it's a bit, uh, it's a bit passe, really. Uh, let me give my uh, my example here. So, the free rider is when people benefit without paying or without making a contribution because the good or service is non-excludable. So, the good examples things like uh, free riding on public Wi-Fi systems free riding on transportation systems, I guess. The other one I was going to mention was herd immunity. Sometimes people get the benefit of herd immunity without necessarily getting uh, the vaccine or some other health uh, health provision. Uh, okay, so good stuff. Let's think about uh, public good just in a little quick sense. Again, let's take another topical issue. Millions of properties in England at risk of flooding. To what extent, please, quick one answer woman answer to what extent are flood defences a pure public good now crucially here please do include some application in your answer you need to explain why they're a pure public good Yeah, Libby has a really good applied example there about the Thames barrier. I mean, in theory, it protects millions of people. Uh, obviously, flood defence can be local. It can be significant, affecting big urban areas. Really good stuff there. Non-rivals, the Thames barrier protects all of London. A flood defence, probably a good example of a pure public good. Here are my two answers coming up on the screen. So they're non-rival. The flood protection does not diminish when more people benefit. So, for example, if there's an increase in population, once the flood defence is in place, the marginal cost of protecting the extra population is zero. And it's not excludable in the sense it's very hard to prevent people from benefiting without uh, without charging. And some good examples, really good examples coming through there 
uh, in uh, in the chat window. Of course, the evaluation is the extent to which you, you choose who gets the the benefit. Uh, the, the budget for flood defence is essentially fixed. It's certainly finite. So uh, uh, decisions about so in that sense, building flood defence in one part of the country can often lead to less money being available uh, to others. Re thanks to Gareth at this point. It reduces the inflationary impacts of insurance, impacting all homeowner premiums, particularly in areas of flood risk. Good point, although that doesn't stop local councils often allowing homes to be built in areas of floods. OK, almost there, everybody. Well done. These are great answers. Let's just quickly look at uh, a carbon tax. So the government is going to bring in a new carbon tax in 2027 for imported products, including steel and cement. Can you please give me your best definition of a carbon tax? And then we'll finish with a couple of activities. Have a go. So how would you define a carbon tax? And then we'll finish off with the arguments for and against. The government is bringing in a new tax for imported steel and cement that does not meet environmental standards. Bilal is absolutely bang on, on fire this morning. We're looking for a really watertight definition. Yeah, thanks. Some great answers there coming through. Uh, it's a tax on producers. Keep in mind that it is normally a tax on producers, although you can build an element of carbon tax, for example, the air passenger levy, which is a tax on consumers. The key thing here is to really zoom in on the idea of polluter pays principle. So let's, let's look at my answer. A carbon tax is an intervention that aims to internalize the external costs. Uh, associated with climate change, for example, encouraging that shift to changing incentives so there's investment in cleaner energy sources and sustainable growth. So it's really the key phrase there for your revision notes is a tax designed to internalise the externalities. Superb stuff. And Tasha has that. OK, well, let's finish off with a, a quick look at uh, this issue. So can you just give me two arguments in favour of carbon taxes as a, as, a, as a contrast, for example, with carbon trading. Have a go. Yeah, down there talking about trying to reduce production or imports towards a more social optimal level. And many of you are using the, the point that carbon taxes raise revenue, whereas carbon trading, although you can auction off trading permits, uh, carbon trading does not normally raise as much revenue. A good use there about social welfare triangles. Excellent. And a shift towards social efficiency. Here are my two points coming up on the screen. So, yeah, again, a nice phrase to use in the, in the exam, the polluter pays principle. So the external cost of climate change and they're reflected in the market price. And crucially, uh, revenue generation. In some countries, billions of dollars is raised through carbon taxes that can then be used to fund alternatives, including climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, 
Uh, if you want to use a really good word here, I'll, I won't spell it up, it's called hypothecation. So you take the revenue from a particular tax, a sugar tax, for example, and fund primary school sports. Or you take a carbon tax and you fund renewable subsidies or investment research in clean energy. So it's hypothecation. Let's finish off with the last give me two of today. You've done brilliantly well. Let's evaluate. Who can give me two strong arguments against carbon taxes? Have a go. Yeah, some nice points there about potential government failure, uh, some lovely points actually about the increased costs facing certain producers who may not be able to, to bear the costs. Some great answers coming through in chat there. Here are my two points. Uh, I would, all, I would all, I always argue so that the impact of a tax, if you can bring in the inequality aspects, so possibly regressive effects, particularly if carbon taxes lead to higher prices and falling real incomes for low income families. And the impact depends, so challenge the effectiveness. So although we are putting a tax, the UK is planning a tax on imported steel and cement. In fact, as of the next year, most global steel production faces no carbon taxation at all. And an emission is an emission globally. Carbon emissions are a global public bad. So if one country reduces taxes, unless you have multinational, multilateral interventions oftentimes the effectiveness can be challenged whenever you get by the way a question on this kind of thing just to round off if you're arguing that something is ineffective there's strong evaluation say well another policy might be more effective in the long run for example tougher regulations or uh, an international agreement or carbon trading so effectiveness always think of alternatives uh, would talking about income inequality be viable in the micro paper yes Inequality is a topic that straddles both micro and macro. Oftentimes it comes up in the synoptic paper. Hey, well, well done, everybody. Fantastic answers to our first uh, revision session. So huge thanks to everybody who contributed. I hope you found the session useful in terms of covering externalities, a little bit of work on public goods and carbon taxation as well. Uh, tomorrow, if you're joining us again, we're looking at market structures and economic efficiency. So another micro topic, and then we move on to macro later on in the week. As always, uh, thanks for joining in. Stay happy, stay positive, stay curious, and see you sometime soon.